Well, good morning, everyone. It's been a long journey to get into this point, but uh, we are excited. And so I'm going to drill you guys with some very hard questions, <laughs> if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> no, just, uh, we just wanted to get to know you guys maybe a little more than uh, what we see here on a Sunday morning on the stage. And then I got questions that we've gathered from different places about just you guys, the leadership, the what's changing or not changing here at the church, those kinds of things. All right, so you ready? Okay. All right. Well, let's. <laughs> so I wanted to dive in. Full spin zone. So I wanted to dive into just some uh, get to know you kind of questions. I'm going to start with some uh, really deep and probing, thoughtful questions. So I want you to take your time when you think about these. I'm going to start with what is your favorite cereal? <laughs> It's a great question. You know, first off, uh, even though this is a compelling question, I want to send a video to Pastor Francis. Can we do that real quick? Can we all stand up real fast and do a, what should we say? What should we, say? we love you, Pastor Francis. Can we do this? On the count of three. One, two, three. We love you, Pastor Francis. There's your friend Bob, and there's your friend Bill. Here's your name. We love you. Just had to do that, had to do that. It's Sunday morning, first one in retirement. I know it's got to be an emotional one. Um, All right. It's a while. Let's get back to the uh, business. Enough stalling. Let's, okay. You want to know. I grew up in the best cereal era, which was the 80s and 90s. So I know a lot of, a lot of cereal now has reduced sugar, but back then. Um, it was a tough race between Cookie Crisp, uh, but Cocoa Puffs took the belt for me. Because the deal is, you get a chocolate milk cereal combo at the end. Because you know cereal milk's not the best unless it's chocolate flavored. So yep. that was my, right. my go-to. Yep. I am a veggie omelet with a side of bacon guy. No, that's not that's a cereal question. That's not that's cereal. cereal. No. Oh, you want cereal? That's a breakfast. Oh, you want cereal? cereal. You think I pound Cocoa Puffs every morning? Cereal. Oh, man. I was wondering about that. It's like, tricks are for kids. I'm a Trix Trix. guy. All right. Trix guy. Trix. All right. You like the multicolored cereals. Yes. There we go. All right, next one. What's your favorite movie? Oh, man, the movie question is deep. Any film people out there who love movies? I think there's two categories for favorite. I think there's the trilogy section, and then there's the single movie you can rewatch. So I think single movie I can rewatch is, is a neck and neck race. One's hard to rewatch which is Life is Beautiful. Have you ever seen Life is Beautiful before? It's an Italian movie, uh, very emotional, so you can't rewatch all the time. But I think the rewatch has got to be Rocky IV. Oh, I can rewatch Rocky IV uh, over and over again. Uh, it's the best Rocky that by far. Uh, that whole training montage is timeless. Uh, the trilogy section has got to be Lord of the Rings. I got to be Lord of the Rings. We're already seeing the boomer millennial divide right, right off the bat here. <laughs> Uh, for me, it's Gladiator and, uh, okay, yeah, right? Uh, Gladiator and Cinderella Man. Oh, oh Russell Crowe, yeah. going on. Yeah. Very good. Those two. All right. Next one. So of all your children, which one is your favorite? <laughs> oh, no, no. I, I scratched that one. Don't, don't answer that. They're all my yeah. favorite. Um, which everyone's in the service. Oh, okay. <laughs> So what was the last book you read cover to cover? Uh, I've gone audiobook this last couple of years. I found out, I'm, how many need to finish the book you start reading? You don't want to put it down just because your mental ascent says that. Um, but I found that a lot of books are boring, just to be honest with you. So if I, if I go audiobook and it's boring, I can go double speed and still feel like I need to finish it. Um, but just for study's sake, I, I have to study a lot for the weekend. So I read that book, The Marshmallow Test, uh, a couple months ago, which is great on oh. self-control. Um, and then right now I'm doing an identity life cycle study that is not fun, but that's All right. <laughs> so I read. Okay. Um, I just finished Seeking Refuge on the uh, Global Refugee Crisis. Yeah. No. It's really Painful. heavy stuff. Yeah. Painful. Good. All right, another one. So what's your favorite or your typical workout? Come on, Bill. This is great. Um, Do you have one? Yeah, I, I would say I, I love doing, I love running, but I don't have a runner's frame, 
if you haven't noticed. Um, so I enjoyed the act of running, uh, but I, I think a push-up, pull-up combo workout is probably my favorite. All right, that's probably. It. Uh, I'm a left bicep workout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> About 50 oh, reps a day. No. <laughs> no, I, you know what, I'm a, I, now that I got my weight down, I'm running again. So I did three and a half miles yesterday. And it's, it's a love-hate, mostly hate, but it's, you know. All right, very good. What was the last date you and your wife went on? Uh, we saw a movie the other night, but I think our last date that was ideal was we went to a, a restaurant called Beast and Bounty downtown which is amazing. I'd recommend you go. Uh, so that was a nice one about a week ago. I took my wife to Barcelona. Oh. <laughs> All right, you win. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Enough Bob. of these restaurant dates. Let's go to it's Barcelona. Nice to know where that, where, uh, nice to know where that missions money is going, Bob. <laughs> there you go. It's a missions trip. Yeah. All right, Bob, we you win. Big. We you go win. big. Yes. Yes. All right, last one of these. So if you were to start a new hobby where money and time was not a factor at all, what kind of new, what new hobby would you take up? That's great. I'd love to fly a plane. Yeah. That'd be amazing if you didn't have resource limitations. I'd love to do that. Uh, mine's a little bizarre, don't judge me. Um, I always wanted to be a cut man in boxing <laughs> and I actually looked into classes and they're yeah I know it's bizarre but ministry never gave me the time to do it because you know, it was out of state and it was 12 weeks but that's what I really wanted to do be a cut man all right as a hobby <laughs> well being a so if you split your eye open I'd love to work on you seriously it's a bad service worship bam I'm on it Totally missional, though. <laughs> All right. Well, being a co-senior pastor, it's kind of the same thing, just in the spirit, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All, right. All right. Okay, so a little more serious now. We heard from Pastor Francis last week about how the journey he went through becoming or thinking about it's time to transition and what started that. And so I thought maybe, Brandon, you could share just what was the journey for you? Where did it start? You know, you were a youth pastor, discipleship pastor. Where in that journey did you start hearing from God or however it came about that you know, maybe there's more beyond this at the rock here? Um, you know, landed on the shores of the rock uh, 17 years ago. So a long time. I was just in kind of that developmental age. And you never think you're going to stay at a church that long. So, I, again, every journey and chapter shifts and changes. So after being an intern for a season and then really responding to need. It was a really unique navigation for, for my life and what became my wife's life as well. Um, again, everybody makes those plans and goals when you're 18, and God loves to turn them on their head uh, as you mature and get older. So I thought ministry would be something I did later in life. So I really had a heart for business and marketing, and that was the direction I was headed in. And then they sent out churches, and I was helping the youth ministry and kind of drew straws. and. I drew the Rock of Roosevelt. It was the one that no one wanted to stay at. <laughs> Believe it or not, at that time, that was a long time ago, 2002. Uh, but as we were there, just saw God open that up. And then uh, there was another job that came up when we were newly married that I thought I might pursue uh, out of the city. And God said, stay. And we stayed. And then next thing we know, there's a move of God amongst our youth. Uh, then another friend was planning the church in about 2014. I was praying about that opportunity and what that would look like. And... Uh, I remember the, the day like it was yesterday. I was in my room praying. And we had some tough conversations uh, at that time. It was a real difficult financial season for the church. And just praying about what's next. You know, is it, is it really helpful for me to stay here long term? Um, and as I prayed, I saw this, this vision of the ship. And I'm in this ship, and I see this sail go up. And I'm like, I'm sent off. You know, the Lord's doing something. The sail goes down, and this big old anchor drops out of the ship. And the Lord says, I'm your anchor and I'm your sail. And this season you're anchored. And then next thing I know, Francis asked me about the transition. <laughs> and if I would be willing to transition to the lead role here over a certain amount of years. So it's been a wild ride. And saying, yes, that obedience journey is difficult. Uh, but seeing the God's blessing along the, along the way has been amazing. Uh, very good. And I, would, I must say, through this whole journey, this last couple of years, you've responded extremely well. Just nothing but honor and respect and, you know, working through everything. It's been a, a great journey and you've just uh, 
responded very well. Yeah. Pastor Bob, so you, you shared a couple weeks ago kind of your journey to come here to The Rock and some of your, uh, you were a pastor of a church in Washington, a large church, went well, um, oversaw several churches there. You've kind of been there, done that as a pastor. So why are you still here with this millennial? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. There's an anchor. Uh, no. Uh, you know, I, I love and have always loved the church, the local church, because I'm a guy that was an alcoholic for 10 years that lived in bars, taverns, discos. Hope that doesn't stumble you. Uh, no, I did. I mean, that was, that was home. That was home. And when I got saved, it was like, wow, this is a new family. And I have always seen the value of the local church. I've always seen the dysfunction in the local church. I have seen, you know, and I, and I, I just love it. I, I love the whole thing. So, you know, for me, it's uh, this, this is part of New Testament living, loving God, loving people. Um, you know, Pastor Francis, you know, you heard me share last week, I mean, came down here. Um, you know, so as far as I'm concerned, you know, I love, I love what's been going on here as far as the transition. I've seen other transitions. Uh, let me just say this, church, um, uh, 32 years of full-time ministry, I've never seen a man honored that well, and rightly so. I mean, so you know what? He was really honored. I golfed with him uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, and uh, he was extremely blessed. So I love the church. I love the world. Um, I love what God's doing in Pastor Brandon, his, the evolution of leadership and discipleship. Um, I think his vision is, is, is right on target. Um, so, you know, for me, it's uh, as, as long as I can do world, I'm here locally. Yeah. Yeah. We're glad you're here. Yeah. So I want to declare up something about some titles here. I know, Pastor Bob, you've been the co-senior pastor with Pastor Francis, and now that he is retired, uh, what is your role? What, what do we call you? Yeah. Bob. Bob? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Or Reverend. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Titles are always something I just live for. <laughs> What's my title? I don't really care. You know what? What do you call me? I don't care. What do you want to call me? Yeah, Give me a we, title. I think you will talk about this. We have a pastoral team. You yeah. know, we have eldership, this elder-led church. Uh, yeah. The last thing we want is an iconic leader model. That's, yeah. that's the last thing we want. Yeah. Uh, churches for too many eras have been dependent on one singular leader. And when they make good decisions or poor decisions, uh, the church follows that leader. And we know there's still centralized leadership as a biblical model. Uh, but we really want to see the elders run the church and help develop what's next amongst the community, amongst deacons. So, uh, you know, ideally, your area of oversight is missions. That's the primary, you know, venture there. So uh, I think to, to unyoke Bob has kind of been the biggest journey we've been through. Uh, we don't want limitations on what God breathes or opens up for him. So there'll be weeks and months that he'll be here consistently. There may be some longer term trips he goes on. The, the key part is missional exploration. We have to find out where the areas of need are, and not just need, but what sustainable works we can yeah. really invest in. Uh, and you need boots on the ground and relationships to do that. And uh, again, I love working with Bob. He can see through uh, any smoke screen so fast. And unfortunately, we've known so, uh, too many missions organizations, to be honest with you, that, that put up a really good smoke screen when the donors come uh, and can't see through it. And then when you leave, it's a different story. Uh, and we don't want that to be the reputation of people we work with and invest in. So, Bob's eyes and as he trains others to see is really important. Yeah, like yesterday, I mean, I spoke at a, a church in Pakistan at 11 o'clock at night over the internet. Um, didn't go well. I mean, <laughs> kept getting cut off anyways. I went to bed. Um, <laughs> finally, because it just didn't work. Uh, but I talked to uh, a pastor in Greece from Iraq yesterday that I've been talking to. Uh, who's leading Muslims to Christ, a lot of them. And you know what? A lot of these people, they don't, they don't have anybody alongside them. They just don't, you know? And, and my conscience won't let somebody called by God to go all alone and slug it out with some pretty big spiritual stuff, you know? So getting back to the yoke, that is a yoke of, of conscience for me. Uh, once again, I love the church. 
I'm here. When I'm here, I'm here. Fully present. When I'm there, I'm fully present there. Uh, and we just have to navigate durations, you know. So, so you're the missions pastor. And I wanted to clarify just the other roles, like Pastor Mark. What's, what, how would you describe his role going forward? So again, so uh, Fran not Francis, God bless Francis, I love him. Uh, Francis functions as a, as a founding pastor. It's going to kind of be his primary role, He'll come in and out. And really, God's opened it up in an apostolic role. He would never say those terms or words. I mean, that sounds so grandiose. Uh, but really, he, when you see him in a room with the other 350 pastors, he's looked at as a significant influence. Um, and one of the most difficult things we're going to face over these next five years is 70% of all churches will transition their leader over the next five years. Uh, this is going to be the most significant church transfer in, in really church's history that we're going to see. Um, and unfortunately, only 30% of those churches will make a transition well. That's, Can that's, I interject yeah. something here? Um, I think the reason for that also is when you have the iconic leader, when you have the solo guy up there, in the complexity of this age that we're living in and the transient nature of, of the culture that we live in, it's like they burn out left and right. You, you don't even want to read articles on pastoral burnout. I mean, I, I think it's an unhealthy and an unbiblical model to have one guy up there doing everything. I think it's a setup for death and not the good kind of crucified death. I'm talking an un, unnatural death. Uh, and that's part of it. I think if, if, if a lot of... Uh, churches would embrace multi-leaders, multi, you know, elders. Uh, I don't think you'd see the single guy, you know, burning out. I just, I just don't. So. Yeah. So Francis really, I, I think, is going to be key there as well as exploring there. So we'll, he'll come in and out as, as God leads him. Uh, again, Mark will be focusing mostly on the community, the pastoral side of the community here. Uh, and then my, kind of my main role, you know, along with, with speaking with, as the team is really say what's the next for the church and exploring locally what opportunities God might open up for us. All right, very good. Let me ask a question kind of operational related to the leadership here. So how are decisions made here at the church when there's big decisions, small decisions? Who's making it? How does it happen? How do you, I mean, we're just a bunch of guys sitting here, but... You know, how do you, how do you make those decisions, the model that we have? Yeah, so obviously primary eldership decisions, spiritual decisions for the body. Uh, we consult a lot of those on our staff and on our different teams, first and foremost. Uh, but then again, uh, Mark, Bob, and I kind of being the primary elders at this season. And then we really wanted to make sure that we're financially accountable as a church. One of the last things we want is just making rogue decisions in our own interests. We really have to keep those accountability boards in check. So one of the models we uh, had heard about Pastor Francis helped implement was a, a financial accountability board, which was an outside board, people that are not on staff, so they could really be objective and, and hold hard lines for what's the best for the future of the church. So obviously, Bill, you lead that. It's an amazing job. Again, uh, Bill has really modeled what lay leadership has looked like to us and the future of that as he works full time, uh, has an amazing family, but has invested countless hours in helping us uh, through the transition. And we have other members on that team uh, that help hold us to what healthy finances look like. So that's kind of the, the basic decision-making process. We don't want to do and make any decisions that aren't checked by other leaders in the body. Bob, do you have any thoughts uh, I was there? just going to say the bullseye is always unity and agreement. I mean, you, you don't want people saying, well, let's take a vote, you know, three to two. No, 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 no. We want the same heart, the same mind, the same vision. Uh, labor and negotiate until you come to an agreement, pray, and then you can all go, boom, start a decision together. And if one elder is not at peace with something, we're not just going to push it through. That's not what we're after. We really want to see peaceful unity, like you said. Great. And, and I'd say from the financial advisory board and the meetings we've been in, it's always been just what you said. You know, we, we discuss it, we talk about it, you know, and pray about it and until there's unity. You know, if there's some differences, we work through that. And it's, you know, prayerfully through with, with unity. Yeah. So given the finances, so where does the money go around here? <laughs> um, I'll let Bob show the fun chart in just a minute. Uh, but for us, uh, just to be honest with you, I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit later. We have an amazing facility uh, that God has blessed us with at the gates of the city that we believe we're just scratching the surface of its impact. But to be honest with you, this was purchased in 2007. So there is a heavy mortgage 
uh, for what really our church size is. So there's a lot of resources that go into this building. I'm sure we'll share about that in a minute on how we're going to effectively do that. But our real goal here is to have a, a low-cost staff uh, overall, uh, really kind of the bare, bare bones of what we need as a staff so we can give more missionally. That's our main, main focus and hope. And uh, Bob will share this in a minute. We'll kind of share the philosophy here and what some changes we want to make. Yeah, you know, churches uh, don't exist just to pay their bills. They exist to represent the heart of Jesus in the whole world, locally and globally. So for me, uh, the health of a church is determined by how much goes out. So we've been endeavoring for a long time in the midst of, you know, changing financial times in the culture, as well as, you know, like you mentioned, you know, a, a building debt that, you know, we're believing our way out and been, have been believing our way out. And so, you know, we want to give more and more and more. I think that's where God's blessing is. I, I do. When you, t when you keep your eyes on the poor, you know, once again, the refugees, you know, people, command Israel was commanded throughout the Old Testament, you better take care of the strangers. You were them. You were them. And there's a blessing with that. And you forget, you forget the poor, you forget, you know, you, you have low-income housing going across the street. You, you ignore that. There's a haunting proverb that says, whoever closes his ears to the cry of the poor will one day himself cry out and not be heard. That's chilling to me. It's not a promise. It's a principle. But we got, got to keep our mind on that. So for us, you know, it's, it's, it's the missional giving. It's the going out. It starts, it starts right here. Let us do good, especially to those of the household of faith. Uh, but then you keep drawing concentric circles just a little further out, a little further out. Community store across the street, you know, the neighborhood. Greater Roseville, Sacramento, the world. We just keep going, keep giving, giving, and giving. And I don't know if you want to throw that chart up there now. Yep. Um, this is part of, this is how our missions uh, money goes. You know, 72% goes global. Um, and once again, a, a, a guy that's mentoring me in missions who has spent a ton of years on the field in remote places said the American church um, is like this. Picture a farmer with a million acres, but he chooses to plow 1,000 acres. And all his equipment is in that 1,000 acres, and then his house is right next to that 1,000 acres, and he keeps over and over and over. That's America. And then you've got all these other almost million acres untouched. That's what the world, I mean, you don't want to go into a bunch of stats, but that's what it's like missionally. Uh, and then when you think about it, you think, well, why does he just stay in that 1,000? acres instead of going out to those because it takes a lot of hard work to go out there and it takes a lot of resources and you have to accept a lot of responsibility to do it and quite frankly it's just easier to work close to your house so 72 percent goes global um six percent goes regional 22 percent goes local and once again that's what we're endeavoring to do i mean I, i'm so in that, you know, uh, a year and a half ago, I started a nonprofit, built sing uh, houses for single moms in Haiti, and built four now. Goal is um, 30 in 15 years. And I think if we can infect everybody with some sort of mission like that, wh whoever it is, just take responsibility and do that. You know, just do what God's called you to do, and there will be a blessing associated with yeah. it. So again, our, our goal is to continue to expand, not diminish our missional giving uh, overseas, but to continue to develop those local uh, ventures that God opens up. The key is the right one at the right time for us in opening those. And that regional perspective is supporting different ministries in the area. Uh, that's also one I want to see expand a little bit. Uh, as we talk about the future of church, I'll just be honest with you. Uh, there's a lot of really well-resourced churches, and there's a lot of really under-resourced churches. So when you have now millennial pastors starting, a lot of them in schools, uh, they don't have a lot of resources. And I know with a young family, by God's grace, we were blessed in an environment where we could still raise a young family and, and, and partner along a, a mature team. For those that are starting off and feel the call, it's, it's crushing to a family, and you have minimal resources. I really want to see us be able to resource the young churches in the area uh, long-term and help them out in, in significant purchases they need to make. 
for their gatherings, and then also continue to expand locally. You know, right now, our focus is kind of the seven block radius, the Riverside community. Uh, but to see expansion, you know, I drive up and down Sunrise regularly. I want to see all those apartment complexes resourced and reached in a significant way. So those are kind of the focuses we're leaning into. Great. So just to shift gears a tiny bit, so what does leasing out this building have to do with that? You've talked about that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so again, we want to do what's best for the resources God's given us. We have an amazing facility here. We had to have some really difficult conversations uh, last year as we've been in the middle of this refinance, which you guys have been praying alongside of us. Things are finally closing there. We'll, we'll know more in the next couple of weeks on what the final deal is. Uh, but we had to ask some hard questions. Is it sustainable for us to be at? I mean, do we need to move to another location? Are, we want to be here. This is a prime spot for us to really model uh, what it means to reach out to a local community, I think, in a significant way. Um, but as we prayed about it, next thing we know, God opens up this opportunity. Uh, we have another facility called the Bonita Campus. A school rents it out full time, which is amazing, and then they sub lease it to another church called Agape, which is an amazing church that we work with, African American community there. Uh, so as we're developing, we said, okay, God, what can you do here? And for us, we wanted to see that Monday through Friday, how can we leverage this really empty space during the weekdays other than some offices and then, uh, you know, occasional gatherings we have here, like community store and the food pantry. But if we can get a tenant here to help supplement what is needed for our mortgage, we can continue to see that missional giving go up, which we really want to see our long-term impact through how we can give missionally. So it's really a really effective resourcing here. And then we're not as dependent on the weekend going well and kind of the consumer mindset of church of, man, you know, my money goes here because I get the service that I desire. We don't want to be yoked by that perspective here, honestly. We want to be able to give freely and not feel that pressure as we make decisions as a church. Uh, very good. So let's talk about what might be changing here? Uh, what about the, the vision of the past? What parts of that are still going forward? And what about the values that we've had in the past? You know, they, are they still the same? Do we, are we adjusting those? Um, great question. Uh, we have, at, at our house we purchased, we have this little small kind of grain annex in the back, and it has been one of those lifelong parables for us as we've been there. We uh, purchased it with a broken foundation, so capture the biblical perspective there. Uh, and it's been a two-year journey of repairing this foundation and trying to get the right contractors that will fit it out and people that even want to do a job so small for a small cost. And then the week of the transition, a week ago, the foundation finally finished. So I'm like, it was one of those God moments of like, can you capture what I'm doing? You know, there's this foundational change. It's finally set that God is allowing us to build the next year, you know, for the rock. And we want to honor the past and the foundation. We have a legacy that's been here, and this is not year one, this is year 21. So for us, it's a continuation. And really one of the original dreams of the rock was to plant a thousand churches. And it sounded audacious back then. And was a difficult venture. Uh, it was a unique church growth era that the, the rock was birthed in. Uh, when you look at 20 years ago, the significant churches were all started around the same time. So Bayside, Bridgeway, Adventure, um, Real Life Church, Scott Hagen, Bayside of South Sac. Uh, all the significant churches uh, that really have, have continued to grow all started around 20 years ago. So at that church growth time, uh, it was difficult to plant. It required a lot of resources to plant churches. And now we're noticing the churches getting smaller because of the desire for smaller communities. Uh, that has alleviated and opened up the lane for what does missional church look like? Micro churches, what can those look like? And how can we reach different communities? So I really want to see us as a team lean into that perspective of planting churches again. And my hope would be over the next how many years, we can't ever time stamp this, we would see a thousand micro churches and missional communities planted. Like that would be the goal. Because there really is a desperate need to reach our generation. Uh, it's churches aging out and just think about this half the population is introverted so when you walk into an environment that is incredibly loud with thousands of people and lots of lights you're turning off 50 percent of all the population that gets social anxiety and social anxiety is only increasing 
We're actually only designed to be in communities of 150 people. That's our mental wiring. That's what normally villages would be wired after. There's lots of studies on this. So my hope would be, and you all, you talk to any church and you ask them what their greatest season was, they have 150 to 200 people there. And they always say it was different afterwards. What if we just capped it at 200 people? What if we fight, don't fight biology, but what if we say, okay, when we plant a church and when you reach 200, you're ready to plant another one. Like that's the goal. And we can see that spread, that multiplication take place. You know, God spoke to Pastor Francis many years ago on the church model. He said, think mall, think franchise. You know, you see this multiplication and there's different flavors in the body of Christ to grow. Because honestly, for someone to lead a church of multiple thousands of people, the expectation and skill set on that leader is a 1%. It's just not real. It's this five-tool player. It's this money ball myth where you have to have all these elite skills. And just so you guys know, I mean, we have an amazing city and region with some of the best communicators, I believe, in the country that are, that are in our immediate region. That's just not the case. I mean, for everybody to be expected to, to preach a TED Talk once a week that would get a million hits and do it 52 times a year. It's just not real. When you think about the average prep time for a TED Talk, it takes the average person a year and a half to prep that one 20 minute. And we're expecting pastors to crank 52 out a year. That's the expectation culturally, it's shifted. So how can we morph and change where people are not attracted to a church based off the content that's coming from the stage, but the community within it? And that's really the desire that the body of Christ has. So you just mentioned a culture shift, and one of the phrases I've heard you use, and others as well, is that we're living in a post-Christian age. So given what you just said, how does that fit in this post-Christian age? We're, we're in a, an era that our country's not witnessed before. Um, Ryan's done some great study in this as well, but there's a church in, in Portland that really is kind of pioneering the perspective on this. As you study different church or cultures that have been introduced to Christianity, or religions of different type. Uh, they reach a post-era, and in this post-age that post-Christian cultures enter into, Europe has experienced this, that which was viewed as moral becomes villainized. A new morality starts to form, and it's an antithetical morality to that religious institution. So what we're seeing is you're noticing all these phobias that are being mentioned, that we all have, uh, and these isms that we all have, and from that, there's going to be a cultural value subset that's going to be opposed. So if you're not adopting that moral you know, belief of the culture, you're now a villain. You're an enemy. The church is just the beginning of that age. We will be incredibly villainized. And things that we once viewed were moral are now viewed as immoral belief systems. So we have to change our approach. And the only way to do that is through community and relationships. Because... We can speak from a stage and people can form opinions and make value judgments, but when they know the people, it's really hard to argue when you know the person. It's really hard to argue with them when you know the love that they express outside of a commercialized, consumeristic setting. So from that, we can build the relationships. I really believe that's how we're gonna reach uh, the millennials, we're gonna reach that next generation, the homelanders that are coming, because they just have this opposed feeling to this organized structure that we have now called church. You know, so we really need to, to undercut that and, and build relationships missionally. I think it's a great opportunity. When you, when you say post-Christian, I'm thinking, you know, that's awesome. You know, isn't, isn't that great? People that are, that's me. Part of me is I, I kind of like people that are a little hostile, a little, you know. I, I like to spar with people like that because I think if we really love people the way Jesus loved, how are you going to debate that? Forget your politics, man. I love you. Well, why do you love me? That's a great question. Why don't you go home and think about it? Let's talk tomorrow. You know, I mean, post-Christian, that's great because salt really becomes salty and light becomes really lighty. <laughs> right? And everything is just this blur of it's everybody's word, religious, Bob. everybody's Christian, everybody's this, everything. No, no, no. Let it, let it be dark. Let it be dark. That's where light really shines. That's what Jesus, in him was light. Life was the light of men. I mean, so that's not intimidating at all. But I, I think doing our homework sociologically, culturally, I think is good. But man, be like Jesus and love people well. And it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Uh, I do want to make one comment. 
We do forget the era that church was birthed in. Going back to, to Bob here, I, I got to meet with a first century historian that studied first century Greco-Roman culture. He said, it, I said, how, now tell me, how perverse was it? When you look at our culture today, it's like, bro, it's like 10 times worse than your culture today. Our, our immorality is hidden, and it's in our homes. It's through the internet, things of that nature. It's not practiced upon physically like it was in the first century. He said, but you would see open pornographic images in the first century in the marketplace. Everywhere you go, you look at the, the again, the pornography of that day was idols. And, and they're not just these little statues they worship. Most idols were performing sex acts. And then when you would go to the, imagine going to the bank and there's prostitution all in your bank. Like you're going to Citibank or Chase and you walk in there and there's, there's prostitution and, and pornography everywhere. That was where they, they did their transactions culturally. So you would walk down, you said there's this early, you know, signs where they'd have different advertising to brothels. So you'd be walking in your footsteps and next thing you know, there's the brothel step. And, and this was the normal culture. So if that culture can be reached, we can reach America. If that culture can be won and fit, over 50% of the Roman empires, you know, converted, we can do this. We can make this happen. This is the way. Well, how do you do that when you've got millennials that are on their phone all the time and you got boomers that, you know, want to talk to you on the phone? Uh, this different culture and, and we're living in the midst of everything you just said, but it seems like there's this different approach to life in these generations. How do we, how do we bridge that? We are right in the generational transition for sure. Um, there's a lot of great study you can do online about generations, and I would encourage you to study your generation. So kind of the four we're dealing with right now are, um, Francis called this, it's, it's called the silent generation, but it's the great generation, one of the two there, uh, was the Depression era. And then we have the boomers, we have millennials, or Gen X millennials, and now these, these homelanders that are coming in. Uh, Gen X, I'll be honest with you, those that are kind of in their early 40s to mid 50s, you're, you're the forgotten generation, it's really sad. It's, it's, it's really tough. <laughs> you know. Um, and, and, and really, I wanted to speak to the Gen Xers, you're the bridge that the two generations really need, in, in a lot of ways. Um, Really, just to speak candidly, it was the generation most affected by abortion, um, and we have not seen the amount of kids that were needed in that, in that era. And so from that, Gen X will be lost, but as they study the different generations and their types, um, the boomers, believe it or not, are known as the prophet generation. They're the ones in the hippie era, the awakening era that they happened. They kind of expose the faulty structures that the previous generation has built. You then have these Gen Xers, which are kind of the, the wanderers, the explorers. And then now you have these millennials, which are these hero architect types. So again, as you study and follow these out, it's hard to bridge the gap between these generations. But as they study them, one of the best pictures is Star Wars, believe it or not. Um, <laughs> I know it sounds funny. But they studied that, and really, uh, George Lucas followed the model of a guy named Joseph Campbell that studied these generational archetypes as they would go there. So really, we have two perspectives. When you have Luke, that young hero, you then have a guide come along called Obi-Wan. And as Obi-Wan comes along, he supports him. Well, the antithetical type to Obi-Wan is Darth Vader. They're the same age. They're contemporaries, realistically. So our relationship as millennials can be either Obi-Wan or Darth Vader to the boomer generation. That's kind of how we have to navigate this. We have those relationships where are built and sustained or they can be in opposition against one another. And so with that being said, uh, as a millennial, we want to honor the boomers and love you through it, but you have to understand. Thank I'm you. A, I know. <laughs> I'm a boomer today. I'm an old millennial, uh, you know, one of the kind of the first subset millennials, um, but they're just trying to find their way in life and they're incredibly selfish, just to be honest with you. They're self-focused, self-consumed, and they're the most advertised to generation in cultural history. So from that being said, they have so much noise and loudness. Uh, they're graduating college with more debt than any other generation in history. So imagine yourself graduating college with a home mortgage on your back and a coffee shop job to pay for it. That's the stress and this tension. On top of that, we've had delayed development because of the detachment from their parents. 
So a lot of these millennials, one of the main arguments is why are they so lazy? Why don't they work hard? They've missed the stage of industriousness that you develop in your elementary school age. So unless if you learn to have industry and autonomy and are affirmed with what you're doing right or wrong, we've had two approaches. We either have the parent that does everything for them or criticizes everything they do. So they are constantly gun shy of moving forward. So that's why you're seeing this regressive state of staying at home too long because they don't know what they're good at or what they can actually do in life. So they need to have that person, that guide come alongside of them and affirm and resource them. I know that sounds unique, but come alongside. And really, I think the re-entrance into millennials is when they start having kids in a lot of ways. Uh, that's when they enter the next stage of crisis. So if you want to help a millennial, uh, find them when they have a new baby, give them diapers, and they will love you for life. <laughs> so, Obi, Juan, would you yeah. comment from, the, from your perspective? <laughs> I actually read an article in Inc. Magazine that says, uh, the surveys in and millennials hate boomers. That was the article. <laughs> Secular ar article. So we know that's not true in the church, but we know there's probably overtones there. When I look at this whole thing right here, I flash back to when I was early in ministry, how easy it was for me to criticize older people, of which I am one now. And I have spent a fair amount of time repenting for my attitude towards old, older people. I vilified them because they were older. And so I think what we have to move away from is a single story narrative. You know, when you hear that millennials are lazy or that's, that's garbage. You know what? Some of them are. Guess what? I know boomers that are lazy too. No, I'm serious. I go on mission trips. I take them all. I've seen them all. And you know what? I've seen lazy millennials. It's like, my God, are you married to that shovel you're leaning on right here? It's like, you know, and I've seen older people too. You know, they just talk, man. Hey, why don't you do something? So I think you got to get away from the whole stereotype thing and love them. You know what? And kick the shovel out from the millennial that's leaning on it and, you know, to go up to... You know one of the reasons I never wanted to get old? Here's my, here's my stereotype of older people. Most of them are just cranky. No, they are. They're just kind of they chip on their shoulder. Life didn't work out. They got a lot of regrets. Blah, 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 blah. They blame this, blame that. It's like anathema, man. Get away from me. Seriously. So I, I think grace, millennials need grace. Boomers need grace. Everybody needs grace, everybody needs love. You know what, come alongside, don't, don't create this divide and you know, lob falling across, you know, missiles across, the, no, man, it's just love, man, love. And let's go on a mission trip together, we'll iron it all out. I think one last comment here is, is again, as a millennial, they don't want to be lectured to, they need your listening ear. They need you to listen. And it will get quiet and awkward, because guess what? They don't have great developed social skills. Because all of their skills are through texting, online communication. So sit through the silence, sit through the awkwardness. They won't look you in the eye. They've never been taught how to look you in the eye, which is unfortunate. And don't correct them for not doing that. But as you're there, listen to them, and you'll see that flower start to come to life again as you water it through that love that they need. Uh, that's great. Hey, one last question before I think we go to Ryan with some, oh, no, okay. So next question. No questions. So what's, in these next few weeks, what's gonna change? What's, what can we expect as the, you know, all of us sitting here in this room, what might we see or not see in the coming weeks? Yeah, um, lots of smoke machines, lots of lights. <laughs> Could we? <laughs> um, if you know me, that's the last thing. Um, we, we try to do so much infrastructural work during this transition that there wouldn't be a lot of changes. Like that was our really, our hope is that it would lay the foundation for us to build a future. And it really, from that, our, our goal is to change the outside of our weekend as much as possible. So heavy community emphasis, heavy, you know, local and global outreach emphasis. And from that, it's going to be the, the same old rock. I mean, what Francis modeled well was a response to the Holy Spirit at any given moment. So just to be honest with you, if you're here on a weekend and you're really hoping that the sermon comes and worship's going long, the sermon might be worship that weekend. You know, our goal is to respond to what the Holy Spirit is doing in the moment. So that spontaneity will stay. 
uh, we'll continue to open up more of our, our series here. Our, our kind of goal in the next three months is to nail down our vision and values and communicate kind of where we're going as a church. So next week I'll be sharing on kind of the future of church and, and discipleship. And then we'll be hitting the values of identity, community, and mission pretty clearly up to Thanksgiving. And then our good friend Joanne Moody will be coming out at Thanksgiving time. Um, so it's going to be an exciting time. And then really in January is the, is the launch of... Our culture course, our missional community is moving forward and how we're going to effectively reach the community at large. Bob, any thoughts on that? I think it's all good. I think you're going to hear a repetitive thing, theme here. Kingdom, discipleship, identity, community. I mean, that's, that's what Jesus was about. Healing, wholeness, discipleship. And we'll say it a, a thousand different ways, but that's the essence of the Christian life. It, who you are in Jesus first, being that, and then doing what he tells you to do. And, and, and everybody has something to be obedient to. And so we're going to help you facilitate that. Uh, you know, we'll be alongside each other to, uh, you know, whatever's in the way. How many of you know there's something that gets in the way, one or two things that get in the way of you being a fully devoted follower to Jesus? One or two things. I want to help remove those things. Be free. All right. You have time for a couple more, or do you want? Yeah, let's do one more question. Okay, I'll good hand ones. it over to Ryan. Just the good ones. I'll get pull out the good list. Now, this this is very practical. I mean, I've, uh, what about Saturday night? Saturday night services? Are they going to come back ever? <laughs> Great question. Um, you know. I, I, my first church I ever came to was, was at 11 a.m., but then Saturday night kind of became that, that home team, you know, gathering I would go to. And, and again, that freedom, the nighttime feel uh, was an amazing season. We transitioned into this church and, you know, split between six services. Uh, we kind of lost our identity a, as a community overall. Uh, then as things have changed in, with culture, and just to be honest, we actually have a higher consistent attendance rate for a lot of people to go here. Uh, but most of my friends' churches in the area, the person would call that church their home, attend once every five weeks. Um, so it just breeds a lot of inconsistency across you know, what you're trying to do and mobilize as a church. So uh, as we've noticed and been praying that you know, the Saturday night attendance... Uh, kind of lost, you know, what we were hoping for there, and same with the 9 a.m., and, and we prayed, and again, it was something I didn't want to impose change with, but Pastor Francis, you know, said, hey, what, what do we think about this summer, just giving this a try, uh, and we just did it open-handedly. You said, you know, we know it will impact some families. It's the last thing we want to do is impact families that way, uh, but as we prayed about it, we said we'd give it a try, and we saw that connection and resurgence that we needed as a community. Uh, people that didn't know they went to the same church were seeing each other again. Uh, they thought they left churches. So really for us, our main hope and goal is community and family is the first focus as our value here. Your relationships go beyond your Sunday gathering and attendance. Uh, but if God opens up the future, you know, for us to do another one with the right resourcing and, and the right staffing, uh, we'd be open to it. Uh, but in this season, we, we think that 9 and 11 is the best position of strength Bob, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I would agree. I mean, like I said, I've been a pastor for 32 years, and I would say 30 of those years I've been a part of Saturday night services. You know, so for me it's no big deal as far as like, but I'm telling you what, it does, I love what it does in the way I prep and pray and meditate about two Sunday morning services. Um, I, I feel like what's happening in our Sunday mornings is deeper and richer uh, than three. Um, and once again, we're open to the Holy Spirit. I mean, we did a Thursday night service. I mean, think about that. A Thursday, that will not does be a Thursday back. night service. <laughs> not happening. Yeah, and that was my idea too, but I think it was inspired at the time. So, you know, we're open, to, we're open to anything. We're open to everything. It doesn't matter. Whatever God wants. His church. Jesus' church. Not our church. It's not some marketing plans church. It's Jesus' church. If he says do a, he says do a Saturday only, we'll do a Saturday only. You know, so we're just open I to think, what he says. I think one thing that is a little different here is we are not ran by a time clock. The only really time regimented service is the 9 a.m. because, again, the 11 a.m. coming in. But we really are trying to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying at all times. You know, our worship is not set to a timer. There's not a secret clock in the back. Um, so we want to be open. And that, that takes a lot of spiritual energy to do. And we're trying to hear and constantly be. So for us... Even as communicators, we want to give you the, the best moment of us hearing the Holy Spirit for the service. And three, it's a heavy, it was a heavy weekend. 
it, it's it's a long term weekend, and we want to really have the best environment for growth here. Yeah, let me just let me encourage you. Pray for whoever's communicating on the weekend. Um, I will tell you, for for as many years as I've been pastoring, the spiritual attacks that happen the week before I speak are absolutely out of control. And I always have been. Uh, so, anyways, to pray, pray for pastors, pray, pray for who's preaching. And just on that note, I think that was one of the questions that um, someone brought up earlier was, what's the what's the team? Is Brandon the only one speaking? We still have a teaching team. You know, we still have a team that teaches here. Primary teachers with myself, Bob, and Ryan. Those are bring guests in uh, to help supplement. You know, that's one of the main things we do is when we're bringing guests in or people we're training from within is to supplement what God is doing here. And also, to be honest with you, training younger communicators is an important thing uh, for us in our future to develop. To get speaking reps is a really hard thing to do in this culture. It takes about 10,000 hours to communicate as an effective communicator in training. That's a lot of preaching. That's a lot of prep. So our goal is to raise up 10,000 hour leaders, those that can lead well long term. So uh, again, that's our hope is to have as many as we can here sharing and communicating for our body. Well, thank you for your honesty and uh, just your insights. And uh, even though we're not constrained by time, I do want to hand it back over to Ryan here. Uh, thank you, Bill. Appreciate Come on, it. let's give it up for the panel. Hey, we can, uh, we, can, we can stay standing, stay standing for just a second. I'm going to pray for us. I want to echo just that value I said at the beginning of community. We don't want to be a production. We want to be a people. We don't want to be an event. We want to be a family. So I'm going to pray for us just to close this morning. But I really would love for us in the room to ask, hey, what's my response to this? Um, if I am in the baby boomer generation, what does it look like to be a mom and a dad to the younger people in this room? If I'm an extra, what does it look like to be a bridge? If I'm a millennial, what does it look like to lay down my pride and serve and honor? So let, let's pray and let's really believe God would knit us together as more than an event, but as a people. So Lord, we just thank you so much for where you're taking us as a community. Uh, Lord, we thank you for the mission that you've given us to reach, uh, to reach the world, to transform culture, both lo locally and globally. And Lord, we ask for your grace as we go through vision and values these next few weeks. God, we're believing you uh, for a move of God in this city, in this region, and in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you guys for being here. Hey, we want to welcome up. Uh, our prayer team is going to be up here. If you need prayer for anything in your life, we'd love to pray for you. And also, it is Connection Sunday upstairs. We'd love to uh, talk to you upstairs if you want to meet our pastors. Uh, have a great day. Bless you. In Jesus' name.